Hi everyone, what's up? Chelsea fans, I hope you're all feeling good. This is Xavier Mbuyamba, and you're listening to the Blue Day Podcast. Enjoy. Welcome back, my friends, to the podcast that never ends. We're so glad you can attend. Come inside, come inside. Yes, this is the Blue Day podcast. And for Chelsea fans everywhere, every day is a Blue Day. I am your host, the creator, the man with a face for podcasting, Keith Lawrence. And today's episode is quite truly a special one for the podcast, as we have not one but two co-hosts on the show today. First up, He is the Tower of Power. He's too sweet to be sour. He is Steve Wicks. And finally making his debut on the show, he is a Chelsea supporter with a surname quite familiar to people that listen to the show. Here is Charlie Wicks. Gentlemen, welcome to the show for for this evening. How are we both? Yeah, fine, Keith. Thanks. Yeah, very good, thanks. Great to be be on the show. Um, Yeah, yesterday was was a disappointing day for sure. Two lost points. Yes, two lost points and, my God, the opposition would die to watch. But we will talk about that momentarily. Um, Of course, (laughs) yesterday's game, Chelsea versus Burnley, last game before the international break, which would have been nice to finish out on a win before two weeks of watching some miserable, dire football itself for two weeks. But um, we were favourites. We were tagged favourites. We've had a good run over the last few games with Malmo in the Champions League and... Brentford, you know, in, in previous games as well. So, on paper, it was going to be f- three points in the bag. But again, we'll talk about how Chelsea have perhaps staled a little bit. I know myself and Steve have mentioned it about certain players' performances, and obviously Charlie, I want to sort of get your views on it as well. I've been a Chelsea supporter mm. yourself, but I want to start some, with some good points. I thought Reese James was outstanding. Um, somebody who I think has gone on strength to strength since his debut and somebody who I think you look at England national sides, you look at someone like Trent Alexander-Arnold and you look at Rhys James, I think Rhys James should have more caps than what he's got at the moment. And the cross that he made for Kai Havertz's goal was outstanding. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I I agree. I, I, I listen... I think that uh, Reese is, is forward play and his crossing is as good as anyone. And I think he's a better, better defender. And I think he now is pushing for a place at right back. And I think he's the number one contender. I really do. I think he's playing brilliantly. Yeah, I think, I think um, in, terms of, in terms of right backs, I think he's I think the most... Yeah, no, I think in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of right backs, I think he's the most gifted and most all round uh, right back we have in the country. I think if you look at the others, I think Trippier offers very little now. I think he should now be out the window in terms of England selection. I think it is a head to head between Alexander Arnold and James, but I think Reese James all round, both going forward on the ball, um, defensively. I thought going back to the Champions League final where I thought he was exceptional. Um, I think. I think he's one of the few players, and this might be a controversial opinion, but I think he's one of the few players that Thomas Tuchel has improved. Um, and you can see that improvement in the last eight months. Um, so, yeah, I think he's a standout right back in England right now. I think if, if you look at what Dries James can bring to the table, you look at his assist record, you look at his goal record at this moment in time, he's becoming a real threat, both offensively and defensively. And it's funny that there's a lot of rubbish that is put out in the papers recently. And Steve, obviously, we we haven't sort of briefly touched on it, but there's a report coming out in the overseas media that Real Madrid are linked with Rhys James at this moment in time. And then you've got certain Chelsea supporters, you might call them, 
that puts two and two together and come up with 180, whereby they're saying, oh, we can do a swap deal with Eden Hazard. And I'm thinking to myself, no, why? What would be the need for that? Rhys James has got years ahead of him. Eden Hazard's coming to partly the end of his career. I know that might be a bit of a controversial thing to say, but that would be a stupid move on our part. Yes, Real Madrid want to get rid of Hazard, and there's some Chelsea fans that want Hazard back, which is understandable for what he contributed to the club, but I wouldn't swap him for Rhys James at all. No, I, Keith, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, this boy has the makings to be a superstar, and he could be Chelsea's right back for the next 10 years. Um, and England's right back for the next 10 years. I think he's a superb player, and I think all these people that keep on about Hazard are living in the past. You know, his, his game uh, uh, record, his games record is really poor at the moment. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of questions about his attitude. Why would you want to sign someone like that? And I don't think Tuchel would, sub, would sign him anyway, be, you know, because of those reasons. But to swap him for Reese James would be an absolute sin. An absolute sin. Reese could be the best right back in the world. That's how highly I rate him. Yeah, I think I think um, I think we need to park sort of Eden Hazard in the past. Obviously, he is one of the best players Chelsea have ever had, and for the what eight years, nine years, seven years he was there, he was exceptional. He's our best player for years. But Reese James' dad said is is the future of Chelsea. Um, he's an academy boy. He loves the club through and through. Um, I think Chelsea have now got a great nucleus of academy boys that have come through with you know. James Mount, Chalabar. Um, we let a girl with a good one in Tamori, but we've got that great nucleus there and it, it's that beating heart of the club. I think to to swap him for a guy who is at the tail end of his career, who has had a rung of injuries over the last two years, so who knows where his body's even at. Yeah, I think that is completely nonsensical from a Chelsea point of view. Well, I'm glad we've uh, sort of mutually agreed on, on that one. I think that would be sort of quite a bonkers decision if we was to do that. But one player that he's been in and out of the side a little bit, he's got his critics, but he's also got a lot of people applauding him, is Callum hudson Adoy. Now, I was there yesterday at the game. First half, I thought he was excellent. He looked like a guy that was just a man on a mission. He had a point to prove. Second half, I didn't even know he was on the pitch for most of the time because he would just looked out of salt, he didn't really do much. Um, Steve, I know you've got your thoughts on Callum hudson the I know a lot of Chelsea fans might disagree with it. Um, Charlie, it'll be interesting, just firstly, to get your thoughts on you, you know, what, what you believe Callum hudson the can bring to Chelsea and what he offers and whether or not he can still be that effective player that people were talking about him when he first came through the ranks at Chelsea. Yeah, I think... He, it's such a frustrating thing with Callum hudson Doy because he has so much ability and you've only got to watch him for five minutes to realise how good he could be. Um, and again, he's part of that Chelsea Academy nucleus that we've got. Um, but in terms of an end product, like I mean, you see the ball he played against Malmo the other day, you think, Jesus Christ, what, a, what an assist that was. He's put that on a plate. Um, and there are flashes of brilliance in each game. And there were flashes yesterday, especially in the first 30 minutes. Um, but then he just drifts out the game and I'm yet to sort of work out what his best position is obviously he's been played at wing back he's been played um, just off uh, just off the front two or front right of the front three um, I don't think he's had a consistent run of games and as a youngster um, obviously trying to break through I think he needs a consistent run um, to actually show what he's about but I think this season and possibly next he now needs to make that step from being a promising youngster um, to a top class player um, because yes he's still relatively young but you know he's he's not a newbie um, he's been around the squad now for a long time and, and he now needs to make that step where he becomes one of the first you know one two three names um, on the team sheet um, and again I just think we're swapping our front five so much at the minute I mean, I, I, I look at it, I think, how is it possible for anyone to gain any sort of consistency when we're swapping all of them every week? Um, so I feel for him in that sense. Um, but he has all the ability. He has all the ability in the world. It's just up to him now whether he wants to push on to that next level. 
Steve, you might I, have a different opinion to that, don't you? Well, if you take yesterday's game as an example, he did some great things. And it's he's at his best when he's taking players on the outside. He goes past players like they're not there. But yesterday, he lacked composure. There was, there was one time where he's broken through, he's done really well, he's had a shot, he's come back to him, and all he's got to do is do a five-yard pass to <coughs> Ty Havertz, and it's a side foot into the goal. And he just lashes it past the post. Um, I just think maybe where he's trying to hard, we give him that benefit of the doubt, he's got to find some composure in front of goal because uh, that's what we lacked yesterday. Composure, but I think, but I think that's the Chelsea team in a nutshell right now. Um, yeah. I don't think he's you know the only one. The whole team at the moment are snatching opportunities, and we lack composure in the final third. We lack creativity in the final third currently. I think he is obviously a part of that, but I think you hit the nail on the head there. Where I think he's just trying too hard. I think where as as I said, when you're in and out of the team and you're constantly trying to you know, make a name for yourself, improve yourself to the coach. I think when that chance comes to him, he snatches at it. Whereas I think if he had been playing consistently over the last few weeks, I think he, fi- he either finishes that himself or he, or he lays it off to Havertz. Um, so I think he's a victim of Chelsea's situation at the minute, really. Circumstance. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking of Havertz, he scored a goal. Very good goal, by the way. It was a great header. He had a brilliant chance in the second half that just went over. It was pretty much only a few yards from the goal line and he just blazed it over. But he's somebody who a few Chelsea fans who I've spoken to before and after the game yesterday, then still not sure of him. The jury's still out. And I, I was, I was delighted when we signed him, you know, the day that it was announced that we signed him, I thought, right, we've got somebody who could potentially be a world beater and somebody who I think, every season the likes of Real Madrid and Barcelona will sort of be interested in but as as Charlie put it with Hudson Odoi he hasn't been consistent with performances he hasn't been consistent with chances that have been brought towards him he's done well as a centre forward makeshift centre forward as such with Timo and Lukaku out injured do you think Kavert playing as a false nine has maybe detracted him from playing in his best position in regards to what he can bring to Chelsea? Or is it a case of play where you can, but take the opportunity as it comes? Yeah. So this is what frustrates me. It really grates me is with Havertz, with Werner, with Mount, with Hudson-Odoi, with Ziyech. Tell me what position they play for Chelsea. Because I couldn't tell you. I have no idea where these guys' positions are because at the moment they're playing everywhere. And, you know, Tuchel's now, what, reaching a year into his tenure. Um, they must be thinking, where am I playing this weekend? And Kai Havertz is, is exactly the same. You have a guy there who has genuine world-class ability and he has all the attributes in the world. He has unbelievable feel for the ball. He's got all the, you know, natural physique. Um, he's got the speed, he's got the finesse, um, he's great in the air. Um, but at the moment, I just feel like he, he's played as a false nine, he's played as a 10, he's played off the left, he's played off the right, he's played in a deep midfield role at times. And yeah, I just think he's a, he's a victim of just inconsistent selection. Um, I probably have a very controversial view on Tuchel, which I don't know if we'll touch on later, but this is one of my biggest gripes with him, is you have a world-class talent there, Mould the team around him. Don't mould him into the team. Um, at the moment, he's sort of a round peg in a square hole up top. And I heard him say last week, Tuchel, that he sees him as a genuine striker. And I just, for the life of me, can't see that. When a guy is that good on the ball and is that good creatively, why would you almost waste him playing up front? Because he's not getting the time on the ball. He's not dropping into pockets. He's sort of stuck up front, running in behind. And frankly, at the moment in Chelsea's midfield, who really is going to find him running in behind? Because that's our biggest issue is our creativity from midfield. Um, so when it comes to Havertz, play him. I think he's number 10. I don't think there's any other position for him, but I think he'd be a world-class number 10. Get him on the ball, making the focal point of our attack. Give him that license to roam. I think he will genuinely be a top five player in the world. He has the ability to be a top five player in the world one day. But it's now up to Tuchel to 
play him the position he needs to play. I, do you know what? I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, he, he played in the Champions League final. He scored the winning goal. He's etched in our history already. But more importantly, I see him as a number 10. And yeah. I see him as doing Chelsea a bit of a favour playing nine. I don't think you will ever get the real player as a nine, but you will get the real player as a 10. He's creative. We lack creativity in midfield. And he's the one that drops into little pockets that can create. <clears throat> I think he could be world class. And I think a lot of people, a lot of Chelsea fans, forget how, how old he is. Yeah, he's he, still so young. He's still so young. And I think he's a great player. Um, and he's one I certainly fight for in terms of uh, and and protect when people you know slag him off because I think he's a class player, class player. He's yeah. got a little bit of a uh, hazard element whereby it was like it took Hazard a while to get real really going at Chelsea. There was he showed glimpses in certain matches in his in his early days at Chelsea, and I think Havertz there's a little bit of that in him as well. He shows great potential in matches. I mean, Christ, as you say, he scored in the Champions League final. So how, how much more glimpse of potential do you want to sort of give? But he's, he's somebody who I, who I again, I, I, I do agree. I think a 10 is his best position. I don't think a false nine. And it's funny that I see Man City do it and I see us do it. I find it staggering that clubs <coughs> with a lot of money, with a lot of players, you know, people, guys with a large squad, they play with a false nine, whereby you should have maybe one or two, maybe even three strikers, you know, on, on your books. And to have a false nine, it's not a count of desperation, but you're thinking the planning and preparation, I don't think personally, there. That, that's just my opinion. I don't think big clubs should play with a false nine if you've got the money to go out and buy yourself a, a few centre forwards. I, we're hoping Lukaku and Werner will be back um, after the international break where we've got Leicester away. That will be a tough game. You know, mm. we, we don't really have a good record at, at Leicester in recent no. years, especially at their place. One player that seemed out the door and somebody who me and Steve said in the summer, there's no way he's going to come back at the club. Yeah, Funny enough, he's, he started his first game for the club this season yesterday was Ross Barkley. Um, God, Ross Barkley. <laughs> God, don't get me started on Ross Barkley. Well, uh, funny enough, you should say that. Ross, D, he showed glimpses yesterday of what he can oh. do. However, he still needs to be consistent. And unfortunately, he's showing consistently inconsistency in his performances. He, he might have a good game, as he did against Southampton, where he gave an assist for the goal. And then other times, again, a bit like Hudson Adore yesterday, you forgot he was on the pitch. Steve, you actually said to me um, on, a, on a conversation the other week, you were were you shocked that Barkley was still at the club. You actually <laughs> forgot all about him. I had totally forgotten all about him. I had, you know, I believe, I, you know, but I have this saying, in life, you should never ever turn around, certainly in football, at the end of your career, and say, if only. And trust me, Ross Barkley will say to himself over and over and over again, if only. Because there is ability there. He's been blessed with great ability. But sometimes I wonder about his mentality. Um, and to me, the one thing you need your players to be is reliable. And I trust in a manager and his players is a very important thing um, and I don't know whether when it comes push comes to shove you could really trust him and I find that sad because no player should ever ever be in that position but no to me <clears throat> he's not good enough consistently in flashes yes there's a player in there Ross Barkley let's get this straight right now Ross Barkley shouldn't be within a thousand miles of a Chelsea team. Should not be within, in the same continent as Chelsea, wherever they're playing. When I saw the team sheet yesterday, I said to, I said to my mates, I saw the team sheet yesterday, I said, I had a bad feeling about the game anyway, because Chelsea have paid over cracks for a long time, especially this season. 
I saw the team suggest that I'm thinking he selected Barkley. That to me, if I'm Burnley as a Chelsea fan, I'm putting my obviously I was you know, an ex rugby player, not a footballer, but just putting a sportsman's head on here. If I'm the Burnley team, Burnley centre back, and the opposition coach picks a player that has not played for Chelsea consistently in years or ever, and he plays him against us. Now that to me would motivate me, number one, because he's underestimating us. And number two makes me believe that we have a chance because he's picking players that wouldn't even make his second string usually. And I just think it sent out the wrong message, completely the wrong message. And listen, Barkley was all right yesterday. He did all right. But Barkley, Ross Barkley should not be within a thousand miles of a Chelsea match day squad. He has, he has ability, don't get me wrong. I, I think he's had enough chances. I think throughout his career, he, he's not done it consistently ever um i think now chelsea have to just please move on from ross barkley sell him make some money off it and buy someone else because ross barkley is never going to be a consistent starter of chelsea ever end of full stop so yeah that to me just summed up the whole day yesterday was the selection of ross barkley i just did not understand it at all right okay well <laughs> this is this is now the Ross Barkley Appreciation Hour. Um, so we're oh, going to sort, of, sort, of uh, sort of briefly mention... We're going to briefly mention... Say at this time that Charlie is very much like his mother. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. I, 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 listen, I just, think, I just think Chelsea are better than Ross Barkley. I think Ross Barkley is not the player we need right now. And yesterday's performance was so flat. That was the word for it. It was so flat. The first, I mean, we created loads of chances and there were times we looked great, but there was a spell. The last half an hour was just pretty, you know, just the whole place was flat. And just for me, the, the certain selections yesterday just reflected that and it was symbolic of that. Um, and I just think in the position we're in now, where we're top of the table, where... I don't think we actually deserve to be top of the table right now because I don't think we're the best team in the country. But if we want to stay there, which obviously, fingers crossed, we do, we need to be picking our best team every week. And I think if you asked a million Chelsea fans, is Ross Barkley in Chelsea's best team? Even if you asked him if he's in Chelsea's best 23-man squad, I don't think there's one Chelsea fan out of the million who would say yes. So therefore, why is he playing in a big game against Burnley before the international break. It was so important yesterday to win, to get three points, go into the international break, keep our lead at the top of the table. But we've thrown away two points. Why? For what? So it just, it just really annoyed me. Interesting. There you go. You, <laughs> no, that, that's fine. I'm, as you say, your opinion matters as much as anybody else's. And I think that Barkley's been at the club since 2018. Yeah. He's had maybe one, two, three last chances. Mm. And I think Tuchel is probably giving him his last chance. And whether Barkley's taking it, he looks a guy with not a lot of confidence. He snatches at a lot of chances. He's somebody where, when he was younger at Everton, he would be the guy coming deep from midfield and being the guy cut, connecting with those crosses or the cutbacks to make goals. And and to score 10, 15 goals a season. He's obviously not doing that now. And I'm partly hoping with Ross's performances that somebody can look at him in January and maybe in the summer and say, right, he might be good enough for us, whereas Chelsea, he's not going to be playing week in, week out. Whether or not... I have to ask yourself, Keith, as well, is, you know, Aston Villa had him on loan for a year and they never signed him. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Like if, if, Aston, if Aston Villa aren't taking up an option for Bayern, then doesn't that say it all? Doesn't that? And, he, and, and Ross Barkley did exactly what Ross Barkley does at, at, at Villa. He started off brilliant. And, everyone's, and he got back in the England team. Everyone said, oh, you know, he's back. He's this, he's that. And a couple of months down the line, he's not getting picked. He's not in the starting 11. He gets an injury. Season tails off comes back to Chelsea, Aston Villa don't buy him. That is literally Ross Barkley's career in a nutshell. Um, I think, as you said, Keith, in January, if, some, if a side comes in and offers us 15 million, 
snap the hand off and let's put it towards some new blood because, yeah, I think it's time to move on from Ross Barkley. I'm hoping Newcastle will sign him. I think yeah, Newcastle would take anybody at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they can take Danny Drinkwater as well then. You've got, they've got a good twosome there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a fair few players we could sell to them, to be honest. <laughs> I know this is going way off topic, but I thought it would be quite fun to mention. Wouldn't it be funny if Newcastle did go down, being the richest club in the world and they're playing in the championship? That would, be, that would be kind of funny. Um, I can't imagine many top quality players wanting to spend a Tuesday night in Stoke or a Wednesday night <laughs> away to Burton Albion or wherever. But no, on, not at all. Back on Chelsea, sort of, uh, sort of touching on the game yesterday, I want to talk about the opposition and again, Burnley, oh Christ, they were dire yesterday, weren't they? They mm. as, I, as I was coming out of the Bovril Gate at Stamford Bridge, heading towards my car, I saw a lot of Burnley supporters chanting, and you know, be, obviously they, they were delighted with the point. They weren't expecting that point, so they were delighted, which is fair enough. But I feel sorry for those Burnley supporters that have to watch that every bloody week. They are, dire they play their football it's great that teams like that play 4-4-2 and they want to play two up top which is great old school English football I don't mind that at all but when you play like that week in week out oh my it was it was hard to it was painful to watch mm, yeah, you'd I'd rather have teeth out without the anaesthetic <laughs> <laughs> no, look, now listen you can't make a silk purse out of a sales ear. So you've got to play to your strengths. Um, and to be fair, uh, we had enough chances to win that game six times over. Mm. But we didn't take our chances. But to be fair, they had a chance at the end of the game to win the game. Mm. Um, and it's important that teams like that just hang on in there and stay in there. Um, they remind me a little bit of Stoke, uh, where the way Stoke survived all those years with Pulis. Um, and to be fair to him, he's done a fantastic job there, keeping them up and keeping mm. them in, the, in this division. Um, but yeah, I understand <coughs> their football is a, is a little bit basic and it's a little bit dire. But I'll tell you what, their commitment was unbelievable yesterday. They threw themselves in front of things. They threw themselves, they blocked things. They did all the horrible things quite well, really. But, they are unattractive to watch. <laughs> to put it nicely. Yeah, look, I, I pretty die yesterday. Um, but I have I have no issue with, with how they played simply because they ha- they have a budget which is what, one fifteenth of Chelsea's. Um, they have a squad, let's be honest, of very, you know, average players for, for a Premier League level. And so I think the job Sean Dyche has done there is phenomenal. I think the fact he's kept them in the league this long. Then they've never really been in a proper relegation scrap. I think that's a, a minor miracle on his part. Um, and actually, when they play against teams around them, who was it they battered three 0 the other week? Was that Brentford? They beat three 0 That's right. Yeah. And they and they looked brilliant. They looked brilliant in that game. And they and they because they knew they could actually come out and play. But let's be honest. Like if if Burnley came to Stamford Bridge and tried to play football and opened up, Chelsea would beat them six seven nil. So I think they have to be pragmatic. Sean Dyche has done it enough before. He came to Chelsea with a plan just to basically stay in the game. Um, and through Chelsea's, you know, lack of a clinical edge, um, they did it. And, they, and the game plan worked to a T. And fair play to them. Like, there's no other way they can approach that game. Unless they'll get thumped if they, if they do that. So I have, I have no issue with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, from a Chelsea fan perspective and from a football perspective, it's not, it's not great to watch a team, you know, come to a, an opposition stadium and basically just try and, stay in the game for 80 minutes um, but fair play they got the point they, they wanted their game plan was executed perfectly from their part and fair play to them this is the thing what we're trying to sort of talk about and try and put a little bit of realism into it is Steve has played and seen hundreds and hundreds of matches Charlie you've seen hundreds and hundreds of matches you're mm. not going to win every single bloody week there are going to be no. little bumps on the road. There's going to be a little bit of mishaps. And, you know, people were, people were sort of leaving the ground yesterday and I was sort of coming out of the Matthew Harding end. 
And there's a few people that are like, okay, fine, no worries, just one of them, we move on. Disappointed, because obviously everyone everyone universally agreed that Burnley were crap. Um, but as you say, you're not going to win every week. It wasn't a defeat. It's not like we dominated 80% of it and then lost 2-1. We've drawn against Burnley before and we've still won the league. So it's that could be a good omen, whether you see it like that, whether you sort of uh, look at it from that point. But it's not the end of the world. The fact that we've had a good home record, albeit we lost to Man City the other in, in September. But other than that, we've won every game at home. So mm. it's it's not like years ago under Mourinho when we had unbelievable players and we had men in the squad whereby we would win every single week and maybe have one little draw in February, but we would win every single match. It's not like that anymore. But mm. I think Tuchel's doing a good job. I said this to Steve on, on, on one of the shows previewing the season. I think Tuchel's doing a good job. Do I consider ourselves favourites for the title? I'd see us more favourites than Man City at this moment in time. Well, depending, cool. what <laughs> depending what Liverpool do <laughs> as well, because they, they, are, they are a very fabulous team to watch and they've got some decent players. But I said this to Steve and I stand by this. I think we can win something this season. I don't know what it is, whether it'll be league or even retaining the European Cup. I can see us winning something this season. Keith, uh, listen, I think, to be honest, the way we're playing at the moment, I think of the teams that are challenging for the Premier League, and I, I, I say... I'd look at it as Liverpool and Man City. And you look at their results over the past few weeks. Man City getting beaten by Crystal Palace. Liverpool drew in 2-2 with Brighton. Yeah, These days happen. These days happen. And I, I, I quite like the fact that Chelsea fans are, are taking it as part of the game and not being spoiled, successful people that expect success. Um, these things happen. We're in one of the most competitive leagues in the world. And you'll get your odd results that pop out. The, 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 the most important thing is that it's one or two results a season. Mm. Um, but to be honest, <clears throat> the way I see it is I think Liverpool and Man City have been playing better than us. Mm. But we've been getting results. I think it's very, very important Lukaku gets back fit and in the team mm. because we are lacking a focal point in our team. And that's where I think Havertz will come into play because he'll be playing off Lukaku and playing in that 10 mm. role, causing Havertz. But we haven't had <coughs> our, our talisman, if you like, our centre forward, our focal point for the last four weeks. Mm. And we've only drawn one game in that four weeks. So we haven't done too bad, have we? Well, it could be worse. We could be a certain team in Manchester. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. That... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, at least we're not, at least we're not in the depths that they are. Um, but in terms of the job Tuchel's done, I think um, how should I put this without being really controversial? Um, I think defensively he's done a brilliant job. I think we look solid defensively. Um, we have got a great defensive record. Um, Results-wise, you can't really complain. Statistically, you know, we've won a boatload of games. We won the Champions League. Um, so you can't argue results-wise. But I, I touched on it earlier. I'm trying to think out of our, you know, main squad of, say, 20 players, who Tuchel has improved. Because Dad and I always talk about this and we say the way we... The way we um, decide on the job or how well a manager is doing is are those, they're those managers who can go into a club and make players better. You look at Guardiola, he's gone into Man City and he's made, you know, I mean, look at what he's done with De Bruyne, Carl Walker, John Stones. Uh, you know, he's taken all these guys to another level. Gund- Gundogan, um, Jesus, and Klopp as well. Look at that whole Liverpool team. Um, and I just think under Tuchel, the only name that jumps out at me, the two names, sorry, that jump out at me in terms of players he's improved since he's been there are um, Rudiger and Reese James. Oh, there's one more. I, who? 
There's one more. My favourite player. Mason Mount? No, no. I mean defensive favourite player. Who I think he's who, improved who? up. Who? Christensen? Yeah. I think I do, no, 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 no. I, I disagree with that because I think Christensen's had... I think Christensen has always shown he's got great potential. I think he actually... There were times on the Lampard where he played brilliantly. Um, but I'm talking about players that he's improved significantly. I think, I think if you look at... If you go through the team, I think... Um, Chilwell's obviously been in and out he's done well recently but he's been in and out um, I think Kante for whatever reason has not quite reached the heights he did at the end of last year and, um, you, you look at other I mean you look at Verne you look at Havertz you look at even Lukaku you look at Mason Mount I think Mason Mount has reached sort of a slightly stagnant period right now and obviously he's had injury oh, problems he's had, the, he's, he's had the wisdom teeth problems etc um, but he looks like he's you know stagnated a little bit um, and I feel like for weeks, Chelsea have sort of paved over cracks this season. I, I couldn't, I'm trying to think of, of a performance this year where, where Chelsea have played brilliantly. Uh, I think Newcastle last week, we played well, but I think a lot of this season, we sort of got results without really the performance. You look at whether it's Zenit in the Champions League, whether it's Malmo, um, whether it's Burnley on Saturday, whether it's um, Man City at home, where let's, let's be frank, we were dominated at home by Man City. Um, there's been certain times of season I don't think we've really hit the heights people oh. expected. Um, I don't think we've I don't think we've reached those heights, and so I'm just I'm trying to work out what what, what is our best eleven, what is our style of play, um, because I, I don't think we really have that identity. But I think our biggest problem is the midfield. Like creatively, that's our biggest issue. Um, because at the moment, I mean, yes, we cre- we did create a lot of chances yesterday, but Burnley obviously are a bang average side. Um, but in the big games, like Man City at home, um, I just feel like we lack the key to unlock the door a little bit. Um, I think that's what's going to hurt us. We haven't got a deploy in the huh? We haven't got no, a deploy in the No, no, no. But you look at that whole team, Dad. You look at the way they played yesterday, City. You, you know, Foden, Jesus, Gundogan, uh, De Bruyne, uh, even Rodri. They're always looking forward. They always pass forward. Um, yeah. The movement of their whole midfield and their front three is just uh, absurd. Their fullbacks are unbelievable on the ball. Um, and I think, and this is where I disagree with you slightly, Keith. I think City and Liverpool are beyond Chelsea. I, I think if I had to get a crystal ball out, I think probably City will win the league. Um, I think Chelsea will finish third, probably if I had to estimate probably about six, seven points off top. That's where I think we are, which I think is good. I, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're ready to to push that. Um, but Tuchel, listen, he's done, he's done a great job results-wise. Our defence looks great, but I just worry about the other two-thirds of the pitch. The midfield, up front, I think at the moment there's no consistency in there. There's lack of creativity. I think the biggest thing for Chelsea as well is teams of the past, there was always a spine of leaders, you know, whether it was Czech, Terry, Carvalho, Drogba, um, you, you had a spine. We always had a sh- Lampard, of course. Um, and I, I look through that team now, and when the going gets tough, which the season obviously will as we get to the knockout stage of the Champions League, who are the leaders who are going to push us through those tough times? Obviously, Thiago Silva, he, he's obviously one of them. Other than that, who are those characters that Chelsea can can lean on, as I said, to get us through those tough times, to push us on as a team, to keep standards high. That's that's another worry for me. But, yeah, that's just my opinion. No, I understand where you're coming from there. I understand. Um, and I think the, the creativity from, mil, um, from the midfield is is a bit of a problem. But it's mm. it's become more of a problem because we haven't got anyone up front that is a number nine. You know, yeah. you stretch with your nine you've got Lukaku who can go both ways he's either come ball, and meet the ball or he can go play in behind and he'll challenge and he'll, he'll, he's a handful when he's on song we haven't had that I just, now for quite go on. I just don't understand why we play why we continue playing two holding midfield players like, 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 like we, 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 we play Kante and Jorginho or we, or we play Kante and Kovacic or Jorginho and Kovacic why? You, Man City went to Old Trafford yesterday and they played one holding midfield player. And and Rodri was in the 
was in the top half, top half, top third of the pitch for most of the game. Like really well. What, yeah. What, yeah, they they look they were brilliant. But Rodri is there's the holding field player, and he's and he's pushing up through the pitch. And wh- whoever we play, we play two holding midfield players, and yet. Again, if you ask the majority of Stanford Bridge, Chelsea's issue, I think creativity has been our issue for a while. And it's like, Kante is about six players by himself. If he's going to play, play him by himself and then play two midfielders who are midfielders that are going to look forward and be creative. I think that will open us up a little bit um, yeah. because there's no need to play two on midfielders against, you know, your Burnleys or Norwich's Samptons at home. Let's like push on a bit. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it, it, it's almost like the Southgate curse, isn't it? Yeah, I just think yeah. I just think it's become I just think it's become a it's become a trend where you have two odd midfield players. And I just think there's no reason why Chelsea shouldn't be creative. We have if you play Havertz in, in as a ten, if you play Mount in this is another thing, is is where's Mason Mount's best position? Because Mason Mount is such a good player and he's gonna be a massive player for us for the next ten years and for England. But both for Chelsea and England, he's being played in different positions. And you're going to end up with an Eric Dyer who has played in midfield, central midfield, defensive midfield, right back, centre back. And they never progress because they've not nailed down a position. I think it's so important now that Mason Mount has a definitive position to settle into and bed himself into. And I mean, I don't, I don't know what his position is yet. I, I think, again, his best position is as an eight. I think as a box to box midfielder, there's no reason he couldn't be a Lampard. Because he has, he's brilliant off the ball with his work rate. He's brilliant on the ball. He's good in front of goal when he gets there. So I think there's no reason you couldn't play him as an eight, play Havertz as a 10, one holding midfield player. Um, that's the way I would go. And that would open up Chelsea so much more, give us way more creativity. Um, and there would be a much more positive outlook on the team. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's where I see like, potential to improve. Yeah, I can, yeah. And yesterday's game was an ideal game to play that, wasn't it? To try that. Yeah. You know, and so that yeah, was a week, you, you can, if you like, experiment in those games and, and, uh, and attack teams and get, mm. you know, get them by the throat and shake them. But, yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 a little bit lacking there. Um, and what I'd love now to have a De Bruyne. God. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's the one player that you could put into Chelsea's side now and that, us going from third seeds, if you like, to first seeds, I think we'd be really close. Mm. But I think I think what I really think what close. City and what City and Liverpool have is they have a number of game breakers, game changers. Um, you look at Liverpool, you, you know Salah, Mane, like these guys are can win a game by themselves. You look at City with, with De Bruyne, with Foden. Um, Grealish when he when he eventually hits the heights potentially you know you've got they've got real game breakers um, I look at Chelsea at the minute and no one's like stepping up to that level um, and that that is potentially the difference between us competing and not but defensively you can't complain at all I mean dad obviously will will, will be well clued up on this but Defensively, Chelsea have looked, you know, solid for a long time now. So that's not the issue. And I'd much rather have a, have an issue with the attack and your creativity than the defense. Um, yeah. And the defense, the defense is there. Like you know, no one can complain about that. You know, uh, Mendy's been brilliant in goal. Um, so it's just tweaking that the other two thirds of the pitch. That, that's where that's the, that's where the tweaks need to be made. And they're only small tweaks. It's not it's not root and branch changes. I agree with you, and I agree with you, Keith. Are you still there? You haven't thought I am. Asleep? No, I I am still there. <laughs> I am. I am. Lis- I'm listening with a, a lot of interest. I'm. St- I'm still here, Steve. My my main concern, Keith, is Mason Mount. You know what I think of him as a player and, and as a kid, and he's he's both superb in both uh, spheres of his life. But I think it's important that he can play, as Charlie said. You can have Kante holding, and you can have two boys either side of him attacking. Attacking players that have the responsibility, and you could trust Mason Mount with your life. If you say to him, as soon as it breaks down, get goal side, because all you have to do as a midfield player, get goal side, he'd do that. He could do that. Mm. And I think he's better playing from those positions than he is wide on the right or wide on the left. They played him in England wide on the left a couple of times. And I think, 
I think he, he could be that creative spark alongside Havertz that would create an awful lot. Um, and I think that's the tweak I'd make. I'd, I'd give Mason Mount a more responsible position within the team to create from the centre yeah. from centre areas, not from wide all the time. Yeah. But, but, the, but the issue we've got as well is we have, we have such depth in attacking positions. But because we play a five at the back, we only really have three attacking positions on a match day. Like yesterday, he played two up top and one in behind. And the other two, obviously, the defensive midfield players. And that limits our ability to pick, in my opinion, our strengths. I've never been a huge fan of five at the back. I don't know what your opinions are on it, Dad. But there's no reason why Chelsea can't play a 4-3-3, play Kante holding. Um, if we're talking about strongest them, play Kante holding. Just in front of him, you play Mount and Havertz. Um, you give Havertz the ability to roam as a 10. You say to Mount, right, you're, you're old school number eight. When we got the ball, you go forward, you score goals, get to the box. When, um, when we're defending, you come and sit with Kante. Um, and there's, he could do that with ease. So you play those three in the middle of the park. You play Lukaku up front. And then you've got your wingers and you can pick, you know, take your pick. You can pick Ziyech on the right, Bern on the left, Hudson Doyle on the right. It then frees up the ability to pick more of our, you know, flair players, game breakers, attacking players. Um, I don't think Chelsea need to play a five. Um, obviously, it's, it's been working. And, you know, logic would say don't change it from a defensive point of view. Um, but I think it was England's problem. It's been England's problem for a long time when we play a five, both the Euros and the World Cup, where we get overrun in midfield. We lack creativity, which was, has been England's problem under Southgate, really. I think it's the same with Chelsea. A five at the back, great. We're not conceding goals, but it's detrimental to our you know, offensive play. Um, yeah. so I think I, I would like to see him at least just trying four at the back um, because I think defensively when you've got someone like Target Silver in there we've got two very good right back, uh, right and left backs um, there's no reason we can't do it and it frees us up then going forward I'd love to see him try it yeah I do think I do think if there's two fullbacks that suit a three it's our two fullbacks I think they're both fantastic attacking fullbacks so but, really but you do. say that but you said but who, who would you say are the best fullbacks in the league um, the Liverpool fullbacks are the best in the league. Alexander Arnold yeah, and no, I, I'm not a lover going forward. No, 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 no. Go, yeah, but going forward, the yeah. League. But I, I would look at it being defensively minded. If yeah. I was the opposing team, he'd be the player I'd get at. Yeah, but you just said, but you just said, if you have fullbacks that work in a five, yeah, then why change it? And no. you would arguably say, you would arguably say that Robertson and Alexander Arnold are your archetypal five at the back wing backs, right? Mm. And yet Liverpool play a four at the back, but they still give them the licence to push on. Yeah. And that oh, means then, then Liverpool... Go on. Who's the most complete fullback in a five in the country at the moment, then, that does both well? Well, yeah, Rhys James is, is the most complete. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not thinking of Rhys. I'm thinking of the one that... It's got to be Walker, isn't it? No, no. Are you... What? <laughs> Listen, defensively he's okay, and going forward he's very good. But what I'm saying with Alexander Arnold, there is always that weakness defensively. You get the amount of times he gets caught ball watching and not aware of players behind him. As much as it's their strength, it's also their weakness. Yeah, but firstly, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to disagree on Carl Walker because I think that I think he is vastly I think, overrated. I think Reece James now. Is very close to him, um, and I, I think, think he, I, I think Reece James is a better player than him. I think he will be. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a lover of Walker, but I think over the last year he's come back to his form. I think the luckiest player to play for England again is Shaw. You know, and, and they're being found out among United. Well, the, well anyway, uh, anyway think, we're, 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 we're digressing. The point I was making was you said you said that don't change the five when you have wing backs or full-backs who are great as wing-backs. But Liverpool do it, and they do it brilliantly. And that, you know, Liverpool hardly leak goals left, right and centre. So, I mean, they've obviously conceded slightly more this season, but I wouldn't say defensively they have issues, hence why they won the league and won the Champions League. And they play four at the back with marauding full-backs. So I would just like to see Liverpool do the same thing. I think it'd be brave. Um, there's, no, there's no reason we should be playing five at the back and two holding midfield players against Burnley at home. 
Uh, no, I agree with that. I agree with that. Like, why on earth are we playing seven defensive players against Burnley at home? Charlie, I think we should let Keith talk. (laughs) (laughs) No, listen, it is is fascinating. I I would would listen to this all night. However, due to time constraints... We will. I, I, I do. I do believe that we should follow this up at a lover time. But what I will do, though, I will ask both of you this question, and I just want you to sort of give a quick yes/no answer to this, based on everything you've just said about certain players, Thomas Tuchel, how Chelsea have set up their strengths and weaknesses. Do you believe Chelsea will still be top of the Premier League by Christmas Day? Charlie, I'll start with you. Uh, Christmas Day, if you ask me end of the season, I'd say no. Possibly at Christmas Day we could be. I think we'll be there or thereabouts. I would say we'll probably be either joint top or second at Christmas Day. Steve, how about you? I think we will be, I, I tend to agree with Charlie. I think, I think the next month is very important for us. Very important. Um, mm-hmm. And we've got some hard games coming up as well. Um, and I think we will be there or thereabouts, first or second, in line to fight for the the, uh, the Premier League for the start of next year. Yeah, we'll be there yeah. or thereabouts. Make no mistake. I think I think if we if we challenge for the title for the whole season and we get to the end of this, even if we don't win it, I think for us to challenge, um, I think that that that's massive progress in the league. So um, I don't see it as a bad thing if we don't win the league this year. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I just, I personally don't see it right now. I think City and Liverpool are just that level above. Well, hopefully, we'll find out after the international break. We've got Leicester away, we've got Juventus in the Champions League, which is quite a pivotal game, and then we've got that horrible lot up north, which hopefully Oli Solskjaer will still be in charge of, because then we've then got about eighty percent chance of winning the game. So. I would like to um, wrap this up for this week, gentlemen. It has been fascinating to listen to father and son talk about Chelsea. There are some elements of every most of the stuff that you've said that I do agree with. Uh, so certain elements I do tend a little bit to disagree. But as you say, it, it, all, all opinions matter. All opinions count. But we will actually talk about this later down the line and it'll be interesting actually having this on record seeing what happens come February March whether or not stuff you've said Charlie rings true and stuff that you've said Steve rings true but we will hopefully do one of these other episodes at another time just a couple of news and notes for the podcast we will be having a few player interviews coming up between now and Christmas those will be announced in due course if you haven't followed us yet on Facebook, please find us on facebook.com slash the Blue Day podcast. Find us on YouTube. We've got clips of myself at Chelsea, player interviews, goal celebrations, the whole shebang. Have a look at that on our YouTube channel. We are on Instagram at Blue Day podcast. Find us on there as well. And we are on Twitter (coughs) as well at the Blue Day podcast. But I would like to thank Charlie for his time to being on the show. So thanks very much, Charlie, for this week. Steve, as always, no Steve, as always, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for being on the show this week, and hopefully we will have you back on very, very soon. But I have been Keith Lawrence. Keep the blue flag flying high. Stay safe and carefree. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.